Welcome to Revelation TV Studios. Uh, we are live. We didn't intend to go live, but uh, we're going to do that. And it reminds me really of when I first went live eight years ago on Revelation TV's first broadcast, and my heart is pounding. So, but nevertheless, it's a very special day for me, and I'd like to warmly welcome our special guest, Richard Dawkins. Richard, thank you so much for coming to the studios. Well, thank you very much. And I, can I just begin by offering my condolences for your very sad tragedy that's hit you thank this you, week. Yeah. Thank you, Richard. I appreciate that. I did intend to uh, do a lot of preparation and even endeavor to read your books, uh, but the problem that we had uh, was uh, the family tragedy. You know, one of our family members was uh, killed by uh, a motor accident and uh, he died instantly and it's just been very hard for the family to handle. But I, I really do appreciate uh, your thoughts. Thank you very much, Richard. And I am going to struggle as best as I can to um, interview and talk with Richard. And I know that our viewers, like myself, who now have not perhaps read some of the books or any of Richard's books, he's a well-known author and is uh, one of the, the world's leading atheists, really. Uh, and Richard, you know, Give us some of your background, because I, I would be thrilled, and I know some of our viewers will, some of them will be upset, but that's never stopped me in the past. And I would really like you to share with us your background uh, so that people would understand where you've arrived at today in being an atheist. Well, I presume you mean my background with respect to religion, not... not um, no, no, just of some of your personal background, you know, educated, where and brought up, and perhaps you're uh, telling about your parents. I was born in colonial Africa, came to England when I was eight, uh, went to boarding school, uh, went to Oxford, read zoology, couple of years in California, uh, back to Oxford as a lecturer, and um, started writing books. My first book was The Selfish Gene, which was published in 1976. And I've been um, writing books sort of ever since. Were your parents uh, at all, or any of your immediate family, um, believers in God or, or all atheists? Um, I don't think my parents have ever been serious believers in God, except that one is as a child, of course. Um, most people are as a child, as St. Paul said, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, etc. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. And I think, um, well, my father died a couple of months ago. Uh, he certainly wasn't religious. My mother certainly isn't religious. Um, so, no, I didn't come from a religious background, but my schools were religious. I mean, my schools were um, Church of England. And so I had the usual dose of Sunday chapel, daily chapel, actually, daily prayers. So was there a defining moment where you made a decision uh, that you, you didn't believe in God? Or? Yes, I suppose I, I switched from Christian theism to some sort of deism around about the age of 14 or 15, and then switched to uh, atheism around about the age of 16, 15, 16. And was there a particular point that, or something that you read or an experience you had that sort of said, yeah, this is it, God doesn't exist? Oh, well, by far the most important, I suppose, was understanding evolution. Um, I think the evangelical Christians have really sort of got it right in a way in seeing uh, evolution as the enemy, um, whereas the more, what should we say, sophisticated theologians who are quite happy to live with evolution I think they're deluded, and I think the, I think the evangelicals have got it right uh, in that there really is a deep incompatibility between evolution and Christianity, and I think I realized that at the age of about 16. Right. Well, first of all, I appreciate you even saying what you said, but I think this is one of the things I'd like to get out of this interview, that, you know, even though we have differences, I, I, I do believe that we can discuss these and uh, I certainly would like to invite you uh, it's like the, not the interviews over now but I'd like to invite you in the future if you would so consider to talk to some of our I would say uh, more intellectual minds than myself uh, who would be able to debate the subject and and do it on in a in a gentlemanly way because some of the interviews I've seen conducted 
um, particularly one of recent times I saw on, on YouTube, which I thought you were treated abominably. Oh, really? I yeah, wonder I'd, what that one was. I don't I, remember it. Was it, uh, was it uh, one of the interviewers in the States where he was like, he's like a news presenter, maybe Fox? Oh, yes. Well, um, I've done a few of those, yes. Yeah. Um, Bill O'Reilly, maybe. That I think that was yes, could be. Yeah. I think, anyway, it's not the way that I want to conduct our interviews and indeed any of the debates that may follow with some of the more wiser uh, people that I would like to introduce you to. Um, and I do see you as a, an English gentleman and, 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 and not one to be berated and, and perhaps people will be angry at me saying that. Uh, but I do value your thoughts and, and maybe we can arrive at somewhere in the distant future or not too distant future uh, at a some sort of agreement even if it's a, to disagree but but we've talked the way through these because it is important fundamentally to a christian if if evolution is to me if it is a fact then then we are deluded and we need we're without hope as the bible says oh well that's interesting so so you're saying that you do as it were put your money on evolution being wrong I do personally, yes. Yes. Um, but there are others in the Christian faith who see evolution as a part of what God's uh, purposes and plans there were. Are, but I, I've now got you placed then. You're, you're, so all I've got to do is convince you of the truth of evolution. That yes, I suppose easy. that. Yes. And, and, and I suppose my job is to, to prove that there is a God. And, and maybe without doing it in the usual way that I would share a couple of experiences with you and then you could tell me and especially as i haven't read the book the, the right. god delusion yes. then i'm not biased although i understand that uh, where you're coming from from the title mm -hmm. um i would nevertheless you know value your uh, opinion to put me right so that i can change horses if i have to well let's get on with it then shall right. we? <laughs> good well one of the things that i do see and this is just was a fundamental question at the beginning uh, of, of my sort of putting the word out to viewers and, and friends that you know I'm going to be doing this interview with you today um, is that there are six billion uh, people on the earth today and, and, and I would say at least uh, one third if not more have an innate belief in a, uh, in a supernatural being let's call him God uh, if we've evolved why have we evolved with such a uh, concept to want oh. to worship Yes, I think that's not really very difficult. I mean, I think it's very easy to see. You could answer that question psychologically and point out that uh, it can be very comforting to people to believe in some sort of supernatural father who looks after you, takes care of you, maybe raises you from the dead. Um, so it's very easy to see that if people believe what they want to believe, then they're likely to believe in in some sort of God. So that would be the psychological answer. I could also give you an evolutionary answer and say why it might be that natural selection of our past ancestors had shaped our brains or shaped the genes that shaped our brains uh, to uh, make us believe in, not God necessarily, but to have a sort of psychological predisposition yes. mm -hmm. that leads you to believe in God. I'm thinking of things like a tendency to be obedient to authority I could easily make a Darwinian case for why one should be obedient to authority, especially children perhaps, and from that would follow, under the right cultural conditions, a tendency to believe in God. Of course, when you say that however many billion people it is believe in some sort of God, many of them believe in a very different sort of God, and so it's a, it's a sort of shaky ground you're on if you try to build too much on the numbers of but billions rather, of people. It is rather strange to me, anyway, at this stage of my life, to, to see that there's so many that already it's, it's innate in them to want to believe, even if they're misguided, as perhaps your book goes into. Yes. Well, I don't find that very persuasive. I mean, it's certainly oh, no. true, but it doesn't make uh, that a lot of people do believe, but it doesn't make what they believe true. Mm. As I say, I'm going to be conducting this interview uh, not so much in intellectual arguments because I'm just not on your level, Richard. Uh, that's hopefully for the future when we do that with the others that will come, if you would so agree to that. But I'm going to read some of the emails and questions that came in from viewers. Oh, right. Um, and they're, they're along the lines that you'll be very good at answering, I know, that, but it will be good for our viewers and also... Uh, in, in this, what, we're, what I'm hoping to try and achieve like this is for our viewers to get to know the man, you know, the, 
Richard Dawkins rather than what they perceive or what they hear about you because the internet's a powerful tool right. for, like for mistruths. You know, maybe I'll start there. I mean, talk to us about being an atheist and does that stop you from doing good works? No, of course it doesn't. You know, yeah, of all of that sort of thing because yeah. you're as much maligned as an atheist as I as I'm a Christian. Yes, um, yes, there's absolutely no reason to think that you need to be a Christian or indeed a, a, a Muslim or anything else in order to be good. Um, there's no correlation there at all. Um, and it would be not terribly praiseworthy, I think, if that were the case, because if the only reason you were good is that, say, you were afraid of God or something, then I think you'd agree with me that that wouldn't be a very noble reason for being good. And so being an atheist shouldn't really have any effect on whether you're good. The other reason you might think people would be good is if they're trying to follow the example of their holy book, the Quran or the Bible, whatever it is. And you get a pretty mixed sort of morals if you follow the Bible. I mean, bits of it are okay, but I don't suppose you would wish to follow everything in the book of Leviticus, for example, or the book of Numbers, or the book of Deuteronomy. Well, there are some things in there which perhaps uh, could be misconstrued. Um, and, <laughs> yes, and, well, that's uh, one way to put it. But there are some things in there that are, are definitely uh, an advantage to us today, and particularly since, uh, well, the last 200 years, we find that the laws on cleanliness are, are, are very important, and perhaps uh, well, you know, came before uh, man realized, and particularly talking on medical science, that they didn't realize, you know, a simple thing like washing your hands before you went uh, from the Godiva to deliver a baby. I mean, they, that was only something that happened two or three hundred years well, ago. By all means, let's listen to our doctors and read what their medical books say. You don't need to go to the Bible for that now. You can get it from your doctor. Right, but I mean, the Bible was written according to, yes. even if you disagreed with the, the timing of it, it certainly was written pre-Christ. So for, yes, yeah. for the laws in yes. Leviticus, on yes, the laws of But we don't have to go on getting it from Leviticus. We can get it from our doctor we, now. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, Darwin, this comes in here. Uh, Darwin seemed to express that the evolution of the eye was a hard case to explain, says the the person who emailed this in to me, Steve, I think it was. Do you have any cases yourself where there is uneasiness with this? Well, that's a famous quote from Darwin. Darwin said something like, to, to suppose that the eye, with all its intricate contrivances, he goes on in great detail about how complicated and, and beautiful the eye is, um, could, be, could, could come about as a result of, of evolution by natural selection, seems I freely confess, absurd in the highest degree, words to that effect. That quotation is very often given, but it, it isn't followed by what Darwin next said, which was to spend um, a, a good part of a chapter explaining exactly why actually it is explicable. Mm. And it's a very, it's a, it's a, in a way it's a good rhetorical technique to, as it were, offer something to your opponents um, before you then dis disillusion them. It, where it fails is if your opponents then take the offer and then don't quote what follows. So, um, the, so the eye is actually uh, very well explicable by evolution and I've explained it in especially two of my books, The Blind Watchmaker and Climbing Mount Improbable. Um, but that wasn't the question you asked me. You asked me the question, is there anything that I find particularly difficult? No, um, because that's not the way science works. We don't say this is a very difficult case, therefore God must have done it. Therefore, science can't explain it. Therefore, the supernatural must be wheeled in to explain it. That isn't the way we work. If science can't explain it, then we say, all right then, let's go to work. Let's see what we need to do, what new theories we need to bring into our science, how we need to change our science. Um, and uh, that technique has always worked so far. If there was something that I was genuinely puzzled about, then my response would not be, oh, it must be supernatural. My response would be, then in that case, we must roll our sleeves up and go to work to try to understand it. Right. Well, because to me, this is, apart from the e person who emailed us in, this is really, and I put it at the top of my list, because it's something that bothered me when I was growing up, that I, I thought, how could we have evolved because the eye is so complex. For example, we've got cameras in the studio here and they need camera operators to, to pull focus and to be able to change shots and everything. And, and the more distance or close up you get, you have to change uh, the, the actual iris of the, of the camera. 
perhaps even open it or close it a little bit. So the, that's all done instantaneously within, from the, within the brain, the human brain. And it's so complex that I thought, yeah, how could we have been bumping around without sight for thousands or millions of years if we've evolved? when really it needed to be functioning from the word go. Well, yes, all right, I'll, I'll, I will answer that, that question. Um, certainly, you're absolutely right, the eye is a most remarkable organ and it does the same sorts of things that these television cameras do. It does um, instant focusing, it does instant stopping down with the iris diaphragm, it's, it's got um, full colour, three, three colour vision, just like modern televisions uh, have, um, and it is a remarkably beautiful it's not totally flawless, there are interesting flaws, interesting imperfections which actually are revealing. Nevertheless, it does work very well and an engineer would um, give it somewhat high marks for being well, quote, designed. Now you raise the question, doesn't it all have to be working before, it'll work, before it'll, it's any, any good? How could we bump along for millions of years with only half an eye? That's a bit of a fallacy because actually um, only a quarter of an eye, only a hundredth of an eye, is better than nothing. You can make a, s a slowly climbing ramp of improvement from just the very rudiments of vision, just say being able to tell the difference between light and shade, nothing more than that, right up to the perfection of a human eye or the eye of a hawk, say. And in order for evolution to explain that, all, all we need is that there should be a, a ramp of improvement where every step, a hundredth of an eye, two hundredths of an eye, three hundredths of an eye, etc., fifty percent of an eye, fifty-one percent of an eye, each step has got to be an improvement on the one that went before. And it's easy to see why that would be. You start by being able to tell whether there's a shadow, whether it's night or day. Shadow's useful, it could be a predator moving overhead in the sea, um, night or day is obviously useful for all sorts of purposes. Then you could imagine a cup. Um, instead of just having a flat sheet of light-sensitive cells, it just, the edges turn up into a cup. Now the cup means that if there's light coming from that direction, it hits that part of the eye. If there's light coming from that direction, it hits that part of the eye. So already the animal can tell the direction from which light is coming and the direction from which a shadow is coming. So we, we haven't got an image yet, all we've got is the direction of light. Now the cup can steadily and slowly over evolutionary time close over until you end up with a little hole at the top. And the little hole at the top, the same principles working all the way, that light coming from that direction hits that part of the retina and from that direction hits this part of the retina, but because there's a hole it's rather more precisely, not exactly focused, but um, light from there hits there, light from there hits there, light from there hits there, because it's got to get through the hole. We're moving towards a pinhole camera. Now a pinhole camera, if you make the hole small enough, and remember we're having a smooth gradient of closing up the hole, if you make the hole small enough, then it makes a sharp focused image. The trouble with a pinhole camera is that the image is very dim because very little light can get through the pinhole. What you need is a lens um, because what a lens does is gather light from different directions and focus it on a point. Instead of ha it having to go right through the middle of the hole, it can be gathered from a wider range of sources. Now, um, a lens is not difficult to arrange. Any old chunk of set of transparent gubbins will do the job better than a pinhole. So once again we've got a slow, gradual improvement. Any old lump of gubbins, transparent, is better than nothing and then the lens simply improves its shape gradually, 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 gradually. It's got to be gradually. Every step has got to be a slight improvement over the previous one. You get a lens. Um, Can I just ask you though, Richard? Yes. Uh, how long did this process take? Well, that's very interesting. I mean, we, we've got um, hundreds of millions of years to play with because that's what geological time gives us. I mean, we've got maybe a billion years since the first eye, since the first focusing eye appeared. Um, what about the trilobite? 
trilobites uh, uh, have very beautiful eyes. Um, and very, very clever. I mean, they're just, it's amazing. Uh, they, 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 have, they have compound eyes, which is what modern insects and crustaceans have. But the and trilobite has, um, in, in the fossil record, is exactly the same today as it was, or in that sense. It, it, it didn't evolve, it had, it, it well, had those lenses. Well, there are trilobites today. No, I mean, but um, it had the lens. Uh, mechanism which is, is no, quite trilobite, powerful. Well, tri trilobites have, co have compound eyes, which is a very different principle and a very interesting principle. It's, it doesn't uh, focus quite as, um, as sharp an image as our eyes do, um, but it is a very beautiful thing. Um, and trilobites do go back um, hundreds of millions of years, 500 million years, half a billion years. Um, it must have taken um, some time before trilobites came on the scene, but even trilobites are relatively recent compared to the age of the Earth which is four and a half billion years old. Um, got, obviously, of course, uh, as a creationist or believer in creation, the book of Genesis, you know, I would disagree with that. But uh, What would you disagree with? With the, the time. The ah, time how old do you think the world is then? I would say that uh, as, because I'm a Bible-believing yes. Christian, that I believe that the book of Genesis is, an, is in actual fact, uh, the, the record, because Christ has well referred often to the book of Genesis, that in the beginning, yes, yes. Uh, Adam and Eve, and I know that, mm. but before we get on to that, because we can come back to that, mm, right. is that there is um, an email that came in with regards to the eye, which I, I'd like to, to read, because yes. it's, uh, it's quite intelligently written. Uh, in Richard's book, The Greatest Show on Earth, uh, and he gives the pages, etc., he claims the retina could not have been designed as creationists say, because the photoreceptors are at the back rather than the front. So it is back to front. And it was a fact, he said, if it was created, it was the design of an idiot. Uh, just, just stop there. Uh, recent research has shown that there are cells in the retina that guide light to the photoreceptors and refocus it. The scientists who did this research described the light guiding cells in the retina structure with the words optimal design for improving the sharpness of images. And that's from physical review letters, etc., etc. Um, will Richard admit he is wrong since he is not an expert on optics and the researchers are? Well, no, I will not admit I'm wrong. Um, this is a very interesting case. Um, the, the, the retina is back to front, and the retina of the vertebrate eye is back to front in the sense that the light-sensitive cells are pointing away from the light. Now, uh, the light-sensitive cells are connected to the brain via nerves, and any sensible designer would have had the nerves behind the light-sensitive cells, which is in fact the way they are in mollusks, for example, octopuses, which have rather good eyes, rather like ours, with the difference being that the light-sensitive cells point towards the light and the wires connecting it to the brain lead backwards to the brain, which is the sensible way to do it. Now, the vertebrate eye is back to front so that the wires that connect the light-sensitive cells to the brain are running along the front of the retina. That means that the light has to penetrate the, this forest of wires nerves before it hits the light sensitive cells which are facing backwards. Now it's very easy to see why this happened. It happened for historical reasons and there's, there's no, no doubt about that. Now it, it is of course true that humans for example, and I mentioned hawks before, see much better than octopuses. So in spite of the fact that our eye has this design flaw, we have better eyes because natural selection comes along afterwards and cleans up after the original mess that was made by this fundamental design flaw, natural selection came along afterwards and made all sorts of little titivations which have the effect of giving us really rather good vision. And that happens again and again. It's very interesting that you get a, 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 a bungle to begin with and then rather than correct the bungle, what natural selection does is to come along and make little titivations, little tinkerings which sort of Make, make up for the, for the mistake, and that's a very in, interesting um, phenomenon. I'd like to go back to the, the timing yes. uh, of when do you, you say that we uh, reached our optimum where we're at today? Uh, how far back would you have to go? Ten? Oh, I, I, I wouldn't use the word like or... optimum. I mean, I, what, I think... What well, because I'm... you think we're still evolving, obviously. Well, but where we're at today, then? Well, well what, uh, what I'd prefer to say is that... Um, natural selection is constantly working and, is, and the environment is constantly changing, um, if only because the, the predators, the enemies, the parasites uh, of any particular species are also evolving. And so you never really reach a sort of finished, settled optimum. 
um, there's always more improvement that, that, that can happen. What about other parts of the body, which to me, I mean, as I say, just as a layman, um, I had to come to terms with, you know, how on earth did we function? And uh, the heart, for example, the lungs, the liver, the kidneys, um, and particularly, don't want to be too personal, but how do I take a leak if I have to wake up a few million years to do that? Wait a minute, I don't understand. <laughs> well, if I was to go to the toilet, you know, yes. I mean, how, did, how did we evolve uh, with the ability to uh, release uh, waste? If we were waiting for certain organs to develop. Well, no, it's, it's not really like that. Um, I know it's a simple question, but, uh, but I'm well, a simple man. I mean, you don't, you don't wait millions of years. It, 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 it all happens. There's a, there's a continual improvement going on all the time, continual changing. I mean, the, the way things work is different now from the way it used to be. I mean, let me, I mean, I've tried to give you a rather detailed exposition of the, of the, of the eye, and you switch to something else. I mean, did, did you find that convincing, what I said about the eye? Well... Not really, <laughs> well, but I understand, well, and I don't mean not? it because, uh, condescending. Because but I, I gave you the, 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 the gradual ramp of improvement. What I didn't quite have time to say is that if you look around the animal kingdom today, and you mentioned trilobites, but um, there are lots and lots of animals which show eyes in all sorts of what we might think of as states of sort of half development. I mean, there are flatworms that have just a cup for an eye, no, no lens, not even a pinhole. There are animals like Nautilus, which is a sort of coiled up squid kind of thing um, in a shell which has a pinhole camera for an eye. So each step of the way that I told you about m might have been hypothetical, but you can find an animal somewhere around the animal kingdom, a living animal, um, which actually does it. So I don't understand why you don't find that convincing. Well, I sp let me tell you what, what happened in my brain at that particular right. moment in time, was that I was thinking of the book of Genesis and where uh, God says that he made everything according to its kind and that it was, uh, and, and we stayed within those groups in, and we didn't evolve. So I, I find it difficult and because I suppose um, my p present position dictates what I, to a certain extent, what I believe and I've got to ask questions in such a way as to help me to see the other side, that's all. And yes. these are, I'm putting it well, quite simply. Let but me get this, this right because what, what you're saying is that the book of Genesis it takes precedence over science. You're saying that a book that was written when, about 800 BC, um, uh, written by whom? Um, by some scribe uh, uh, during the Babylonian captivity? Um, wh why would no, you it believe? Goes back, it goes back further than that, and certainly would it, most scho Bible scholars have attributed the book of Genesis to uh, Moses. Oh, really? Yes, to Moses? Yes. But, um, Bible scholars attribute it to Moses. I, I, I know so. you attribute it to Moses, yes. but yes. can you name a Bible scholar who attributes it to Moses? I can't at this moment yeah. in time, okay. just off the top of my head, but okay. that doesn't stop me believing in God. And maybe at, within this interview, I'd like to ask you to listen to some of the experience I've had, which uh, would certainly probably... Uh, come under this title here, uh, God Delusion, as far as you're concerned. But because the thing, I didn't have to intellectualize my belief and faith in God. Um, to start with, I had many, many questions as I started to read the Bible. And uh, sadly, to some, for some to hear this, it was the very first book I ever read because I'm dyslexic. But I made an attempt to read it from beginning to end. And it did take me the first time two and a quarter years. But... As I started to read through it entirely, have you, by the way, have, have you ever read right the way through I the Bible? I have not, no. Okay. Have well, you read the Quran all the way through? No, but about a quarter of the way through at the right. moment. So wh why would you read the Bible rather than the Quran? It's just the way that um, I, ended, I, sta I started to be introduced to the Bible. Yes, and but I if you had it. read the Quran, maybe you'd be a Muslim. Possibly. Mm. But, so uh, doesn't that shake your confidence a bit? Not at all, because mm. of what I'm going to, going to try okay. and explain to you. All right. What happened to me is um, there were some, what I would call, supernatural experiences. And I, this is where I would say that, to, for me, God is real. And therefore, I, it comes back to the, the point of my believing in Genesis and other parts of the Bible. Some are difficult to understand, I admit that. But when something like uh, has happened to me, and if I explain this to you, maybe the most powerful experience, and I wasn't alone at the time, and I have several experiences, more in my latter years, um, since in my 40s, and I'm now 65, nearly, uh, is that I was 
doing some voluntary work on a ship uh, called Mercy Ships, and I was on the, in the borders uh, of Haiti and uh, Dominican Republic. And what happened was we were dealing with very, very poor people, lots of needs, medical needs, because it had three operating rooms on the ship, and they were operated, um, the ships run by Christians who were volunteers. I was there uh, doing a course with them, and it was very, very hard for me, as, as an Englishman, to watch what happens in a lot of evangelical circles and churches, is that this power of what was described as the Holy Spirit coming into you, the Spirit of God coming into you. And one morning, um, when I was on the ship, my wife was with me, and there were 30 other people in the class. And I saw people being prayed for if they wanted to receive the Holy Spirit. And Richard, I can honestly say to you, I was not in the mood that day. I was, at, I was far from being in, put into a, uh, the right mood to accept something like this. And I was watching people go forward being prayed for. And they, to me, it looked a bit fake. I'll be honest, okay? And I'm, yet I'm supposed to believe some of this stuff. Uh, the gentleman that was Bernie, Bernie Olgavy, he was an Australian, very hard-hitting, down-to-earth sort of Aussie. And I went up and I said to, to my God, privately in my mind, if there is something there, Lord, I will have it, but I don't want it if it's not real. I stood before this man, and fortunately, he never touched me because I'm not into that. I don't know whether you've seen it, people lay hands on you and they fall over. I wasn't into that. And so as Bernie started to pray for me, this incredible, uh, I can describe it as, a, as an electrical force, went into the small of my back and it went through my torso and it was like thousands of volts my my body started to burn inside and it felt like burning and my joints and everything were uh, li like it was in my death throes like i'd been hit by a bus or something and and all of my joints and everything were uh, quivering i'm struggling trying not to let this affect me and bernie says to me you can't withstand the power of god and I'll be, this is what i said I said, I can because I'm an Englishman. I'm not into this sort of stuff. And eventually I did succumb. I was on the floor. And this powerful energy that went into me, um, it took me many hours to be able to get back to my cabin. And I just couldn't understand it. Now, I know the scriptures, you know, where it says he will baptize you with fire as well as with water and all of that. And the next day, Richard, I'm, well, I'm praying with somebody who was in the classroom with me. There, there was a need for prayer. And we held hands. And this electrical power came back out from my torso in reverse and went down my hands and into this person. Now, I didn't say anything. I thought, oh, my goodness, what is happening? And this person went like that, and, and, and uh, she said, what was that? And I said, what was what? You know, I wasn't going to have any nonsense, okay? And she said, I felt some electrical power come out of you. And I said, I said, what on earth is going on? This person who was sitting next to me in the classroom the day before, amongst these other 30 people and my wife, said, I saw exactly what happened. And I said, how could you see? I was really not wanting to, I was trying to play devil's advocate in this sense. I said, how could you see nobody else see? See what? She said, and she described this uh, beam that came out through the ceiling, went straight into my back, and that exactly that. Yes, well, look, um, you said you weren't impressed with my account of the eye. I'm afraid I'm not very impressed with anecdotes. Let me finish. I went out into one of the villages surrounding Barahona. We'd, the previous day, we'd buried a child that was had starved to death. We couldn't help that particular child. Mercy Ships helps lots of people successfully, usually. This was an occasion we couldn't help. And we went to support the family. When we were up in the hills, there was just myself and another person at that time. And we heard this incredible noise, like animal noise, like somebody crying, screaming, whatever. 
And because I don't speak Spanish, they grabbed hold of me, the, a few people, and they pulled me and this other guy to witness there was a, a slab of concrete about the size of this because they live in very poor conditions. It was just like cardboard walls, and, but some had a, a, a concrete slab for their foundation. And this elderly lady was on the floor, perspiring. She, she soaked the concrete so much, so she was crying unbelievably. And then somebody pulled us from there and took us into this hut, makeshift hut. And there was a young girl lying there and she was covered from head to foot in like boils from what I could see. Terrible sores. And she was laid still. And I thought, what do I do? I'm a novice. I just prayed. I said, what would Jesus do? And I just prayed, Lord, make her well. She sat boat right up. And I said, what? And I thought, what else do I do? I'm a simple man. Read the scriptures before. And Jesus said, give her water. That's from the time when he was doing something similar. And so I did that. And I didn't know it at the time. But apparently the lady that was outside bemoaning had been there for hours because her daughter had apparently died. Now, this again, this electrical power comes out of my body. How do you describe that? Am I deluded? Probably, yes. Um, I, I mean, scientists are not impressed by anecdotes. Um, if you could get a scientist to measure the, the, I don't know, your galvanic skin response, you might get some sort of scientific interest in that. But it really, I mean, there are thousands of stories all over the world. People have ghost stories, people have stories of demonic possession, all different religions. Um, they're just not impressive, I'm afraid, to a scientist. And in particular, what I'd like to concentrate on is why, even if the, these experiences happen to you, why on earth would that make you believe in the book of Genesis, given that all the scientific evidence is against it, given that the Archbishop of Canterbury is against it, given that the Pope is against it, given that any respectable bishop is against it, why would you go from having electrical tingling down your back Wasn't to saying tingling. that the book of Genesis has got to be true? Mm. Why tie it to the book of Genesis? All right. When I first read the Bible, the things that attracted me uh, or impressed me was the prophetic value of scripture as a man I'm not I wasn't as emotionally involved as say my wife would be have been because I'm at that stage I wasn't sort of in love with Jesus so I, I needed more sort of facts if you like and historically I know you probably would, could argue the points about this but there were prophecies in the Bible that actually were fulfilled. Like uh, what? Well, just talking about the, the birth, uh, for example, of Jesus in the book of Micah, uh, which is written apparently 500 years before Christ came, explaining that he'd be born in Ephratah, Bethlehem. And even Herod, who was definitely not a believer, used, uh, asked his wise men to find out where it was and how it was and when it would be that this Messiah would come because Herod actually... But, but surely you know that the Gospels were written in, in the way they were in order to fulfill those Old Testament prophecies. No, I know you would say that, Richard, well, but I, I don't believe it. That's what New Testament it. scholars no. say. I like you but in say, any I'm case, it's nothing to do with, with Genesis. Mm. I mean, you're talking about Micah now. Genesis... Well, I could mention loads of... What about the Babylonian exile, Jeremiah, the prophet? Look, that, that's not relevant to the book of Genesis, where you, you say, on the strength of the book of Genesis, you believe that the world is, what, only... 6,000 years old, something like, like yes. that? Yeah, okay. Now, that, as you know, flies in the face of all the scientific evidence. It flies in the face of all the bishops, all the archbishops, the cardinals, pope. Not why all would of them, you, but so, yes, Well, I, most of them. Yeah. Um, why would you put your money on the book of Genesis, nothing to do with Jeremiah, nothing to do with Micah, it's the book of Genesis. Why would you put your money on that when all the scientific evidence shows, and I mean not a little bit of evidence, but massive quantities of evidence show that the world is four and a half billion years old. It, I mean, it's absolutely open and shut case. Look at the science. You can't deny it if you would only look at the science. Okay, well, you asked me the question, why would I put my faith in Genesis? It is a difficult book, given um, that there is so much so-called evidence to the contrary that or what, we, what scientists are talking about as that, you know, the Earth is 
millions of years old, etc. But Jesus, and I do believe 100% that Jesus did walk this earth and did the things that he did, because uh, there are more manuscripts written about the, the accounts uh, of the yes, gospel. Yes, but we're not talking Jesus, we're talking Genesis now. Well, so. well, let me get there, Richard, please. Is that Jesus referred to Genesis, okay? And in there, he, he, he's not a liar, um, and he's a man that, or a being that I would trust. And he spoke about, in the beginning, you know, was Adam and Eve, for example. And he also talks about, he talks about in Colossians, that he, Jesus, is the one who created all things, okay? Mm. So if, if Jesus is the one that I accept, then why should I deny Gen the Genesis account? Because otherwise I'm saying Jesus is a liar. Well, um, if you're tying Jesus to a belief that the world is only, only 6,000 years old, you're not doing Jesus any favors because what you're in effect saying is that Jesus was anti-scientific, and I don't think Jesus would be very pleased about that. Um, no doubt he was ignorant of science because he lived at a time when he did when science was not, de not developed. But if Jesus I were you, I would not <coughs> tie Jesus, whom Jesus, you love. Jesus uh, was not ignorant. Well, um, uh, if you look at, and I was reading again this morning, some of the wisdom that he had, uh, we could do with today for sure. Well, I believe that may be true, but nevertheless, if I were you and you love Jesus, I would not tie Jesus to the belief that the world is only 6,000 years old because you're tying Jesus to an error and you wouldn't wish to do that. There are many Christians who certainly disagree with me on the age of the earth. But let's just go back to the beginnings or the origins of man, which is definitely not where you are coming from as an evolutionist, that man has evolved over millions or billions of years. God says very clearly, uh, let us make man in our image. Therefore, there was a plural as well, and that's where um, Jesus comes into this as well. But that, that he has stated that he created all things. Okay? The book of Genesis and stated that. Day one, that. day two, and you, goes through You those. said he stated that. The, the truth is the book of Genesis stated that. Yes. Yes, okay. But because the Lord Jesus Christ was there in the beginning as part of the Godhead, um, he could refer to it, and it's not, and I know, I know it would be hard for you to accept this, but, Richard, but Jesus was before he came as a man on the earth. He was before. Do, do, and you, therefore, do you know the evidence for the age of the earth? Do you, do, you, do you know why scientists believe the world is billions of years old? Yes, I hear the arguments, but uh, there are many people like myself, we're not super intelligent but there are those that I said I would love you to to get involved with but I wanted this to be more of um, a sort of a getting to know each other and a trust if you like so that we could carry on with these discussions in, a, in an intellectual way but me as a simple as a simple person there uh, we're looking at the description in the first chapter of Genesis on day one and it uses the Hebrew word yom which is a literal 24 hour days. Now I know some people would say there's a, there's a gap there between Genesis 1 and uh, 2 and 3, and there possibly there could have been uh, this evolutionary process that God may have used. Now we know that many of the bishops and archbishops, as you say, would believe in such a thing but in order to uh, entertain, if you like, or allow for the evolutionary theory to be expanded upon or, or accepted by other Christians. But just looking at it, uh, are you saying, well, no, of course, I, I know you're not saying, I believe that God created us and that we are intelligently designed and perfect. Well, I know you perfectly. believe it, but you don't have any reason to believe it. And you're, you're putting well, everything on this one book of Genesis. No, and you're, I, and you're accepting the, the book Bible. of Genesis because it's part of the Bible. And you mentioned Jeremiah and Micah. And because you see the Bible as a whole, but you know very well that the Bible is a collection of separate books, which was, which was put together in a rather random way and it could easily have been some other account, some other creation myth. The world is full of creation myths, and the Jewish one happens to be um, the one that, that 
you believe, because it got into the, into the Bible. But Australian Aboriginals have another creation myth, and all the different African tribes have another one. Every tribe in the world has a creation myth, and some of them are quite beautiful. The Jewish one's not at all bad. But why on earth would you believe this particular one, just because it happens to have got into the canon, which is the Christian Bible? First of all, the very first prophecy is in, Ge uh, in Genesis, and there are many other, um, uh, the whole foundation, if you like, of the base, basis for our faith is the accounts of Abraham are in there. Um, and Abraham? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a Abraham, the one who nearly killed his son. Um, not a very edifying moral story, is it? It prefigures uh, really what the Lord did, uh, offered his son. It does, doesn't it? It does. Yes. They're both as ugly as each other, both the stories. Well, if you, if you look at it initially like that, uh, uh, at first glance, yes, you might come up with that conclusion. But for me, Richard, when, when you look at the whole Bible and you look at particularly the life of Christ, he had such compassion. He healed the sick, he raised the dead. He wept with those that wept, uh, who were mourning. And Jesus, uh, the character of Jesus, is not at all like I believe that you believe him to be. And he is a, a direct representation of God. Jesus seems to me to have been rather a good man. Um, the story that he gave his life for our sins uh, is a story that was made up later. Uh, and it's a very unpleasant story indeed. I mean, the idea of the scapegoat, the idea... Well, Genesis, let me stop you there. Genesis chapter 3... Verse 15, I believe it is, actually talks about that there would be a Messiah that would actually uh, be bruised in the heel, you know, almost put to death, but raised. Uh, the, if you look at that, Bible scholars do, again, uh, say that that is the very first prophecy well, in the Bible, time and alluding again, to Christ. you come back to a biblical quotation as though I'm supposed to be impressed. I mean, why would you expect no, me I'm to be impressed? I'm not trying to impress you, mm. Richard. I'm just trying to give you... I, I'm happy to, for you to have your belief in evolution and long-term, you know, sort of understanding of how we evolved. Well, I would just ask you that, um, I'm not going to be rude to you, I'm asking you to consider my position so that we c you can see where the, the differences are yes. and perhaps open for discussion. I consider not just your on, position. Not I just this your, one. your position comes from reading the Bible. Um, and I've tried to suggest to you that there's no particular reason why you should read the Bible rather than any other holy book which you could get from anywhere around the world. Now we started to talk about Jesus and Jesus' um, self-sacrifice which you pointed out mirrors that uh, the, the sacrifice of Abraham's um, son. Now um, the idea that God could only forgive our sins by having his son tortured to death as a scapegoat is surely, from an objective point of view, a deeply unpleasant idea. If God wanted to forgive us our sins, why didn't he just forgive them? Why did he have to torture, have his son tortured? That's a very good question. Well, what's your answer? Genesis. How does Genesis answer that question? Because Adam was made perfect. And what happened through his disobedience, if you like, simple uh, test and he lost that perfection for us, for us all as a human race, according to scripture. And the need for a Messiah or uh, another perfect being of the same degree of perfection uh, could only be the proper ransom for our redemption. God was in a position to accept any ransom he chose, presumably, why on earth would he have his son tortured for the sin of somebody who lived how long before, for 4,000 years before, if you believe that Adam did? Because Adam scrumped an apple. Why would that sin reverberate down the ages and have to be uh, redeemed by the torturing of God's own son? Why didn't God say, I forgive you, I forgive you? It, I, it's in my power to be, no, what he said was, my son has to be tortured to death, no. just like mm. Abraham. I don't think that was the way, I, well, certainly not the way I read it, but I see it, uh, God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son well, as a ransom you, sacrifice. You're quoting scripture again, but um, why wouldn't God just forgive us if that's what he wanted to he do? He could have done it that way, but he chose being uh, the sort, 
the God that he is, he, allowing for um, us to have free will, and it wasn't just grumping an apple, uh, there was more to it than that. Um, Adam was plainly disobedient, and I think he even admits it himself in the fact that he uh, hid from God that particular evening because there was a, a fellowship between man and God um, every day. So Adam was disobedient and that sin reverberated down the ages is inherited by all humans. Mm. What kind of a doctrine is that? Inherited by all humans and had to be redeemed by the Son of God being tortured to death. What kind of a morality are you propagating there? That's a very good question. Uh, Paul puts it very well in Romans chapter 5. Well, Paul invented it, so he would. No, because Paul was in the era at the time of Christ, and we're talking 4,000 years before that. Um, Paul said that just through one man's uh, disobedience, Adam, uh, death came th to all mankind because all have sinned. You know, it's, it's, that's why we needed another perfect life, and Paul talks about it very clearly much better than I do, uh, that the, the ransom price had to be a perfect life. And that's another reason why he was born of a virgin and had no earthly father, um, because of the bloodline. But, you know, we, we could argue all day about these things, and I haven't even got to some of the uh, emails. On, but okay. um, but I, please, Richard, uh, mm. you know, s see my heart, not, not my intellect, because my heart is for mankind as well. Oh, I can see that. You know, yes. and, uh, mm. we, you know, we, mm. we both care for the future. And, um, but, uh, you know, I just wondered, and I, I mean this with all sincerity, you know, is that is there something in particular that, that really you can't stand about God? About God. Uh, well, I don't think God, God exists, so, that, so obviously I, that, that wouldn't apply. Uh, there's something but I can't stand about Christianity, which is just what I've been saying about this, this really obnoxious doctrine of original sin, which I think is, is, is actually hideous and uh, demeaning, and um, is, um, it's, a, it's a vengeful doctrine. Um, it's the idea that, uh, that one can be um, absolved, that, that, uh, that a sin by somebody else has to be paid for by a different person, which is a, which is a horrible idea. Um, it's well, everything it about it is, okay. a, is an obnoxious doctrine. I, 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 again, I can see where you're coming from, and I, and I mean that with all sincerity. But let's take the case, say, uh, of a, a thief has gone before the courts and he's guilty, even though he might have uh, said he wasn't guilty. Uh, you know, it's proven he is, uh, without doubt. And he's sentenced, um, and quite rightly so. The judge, because he's a good judge, he says, right, you're guilty, but I'm going to pay your fine or even go to prison for it. In a way, simple way, that that's the way I see the, how God set up um, the, for his son to be the ultimate sacrifice. And that, I can't think well, of... Well, that would be persuasive if the judge said, you're forgiven. That, that would be great. That, that would be the kind of thing one could empathize with. But that's not what he said. He said, OK, we're going to hang somebody else for your, for your crime. Um, no, the, the judge said, I'll give you my son. Now, wouldn't that be incredible? Uh, I think it would be disgusting. I mean, I think, I think it's a horrible idea that, that, that somehow, the, given that the judge has all, is all-powerful, given that the judge has the power to forgive if he wants to, that the only way he can do it is to sacrifice his son I mean, what an incredibly unpleasant way to do it, when, when, given that you've got the power to forgive. You're all-powerful. I, I see it differently, that he, he loved us so much that he was willing to do that. And having just gone through uh, a terrible week with uh, the, the tragic death in our family, uh, sudden death of a young boy, we would have... You could see how much God must have gone through to see his son go through that painful that makes it sacrifice. Even worse. I mean, it makes it even, even worse, what he would, given that he could have simply forgiven. Well, forgiven well, us. Well, we don't know. For example, there could have been a conversation between the son and the father in heaven before coming down, and maybe in that sense, Jesus said, I will do it. It's and there could have been a... Uh, I mean, it's a but that presupposes honestly. that it was necessary for somebody to do it. Why not just... It had to be okay. somebody perfect. And but why did it have to sin? be somebody for sacrificed at all? 
a life a life for a life. A life for a life, exactly. What kind of a morality is that? Well, I, I personally believe that that helps us to, to live a good life and respect for each other, that I would stop, if I was angry at someone, from taking their life and letting it go further, but to forgive. Well, I would forgive as well, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about a life for a life, which is very different. Mm. But you had some other questions, didn't you? Yes, we yes. did indeed. Um, Many have come in, so let me just quickly go through these. Um, in your interview with Bill Moyers um, on the 3rd of December 2004 on PBS USA, uh, Richard is quoted as saying, evolution has been observed, it is just that it hasn't been observed while it's happening. If evolution has not been observed while it is happening, then isn't your belief in evolution a belief by faith? And if so, how does this faith differ from the creationists? Evolution is a process that takes a very long time uh, to, for interesting things to happen anyway. It takes millions of years um, for really major evolutionary change to happen. Um, you can see it happening. Uh, I mean, we, we, we do see it happening in a small way, but of necessity, what you can see during a human lifetime is relatively short, li relatively little. And in my book, The Greatest Show on Earth, I've given some um, examples of that. But the, the burden of the question is, if you can't see it happening before your very eyes, doesn't that mean that you have to have faith in order to believe it? The answer is no, of course it doesn't. Uh, because what you see is the traces, the remains, you see the, uh, the consequences of the evolutionary process, even though you can't actually um, watch it happening before your very eyes. It's a bit like I've likened it to the process whereby a detective comes on the scene of a crime after the crime has been committed. Now, the detective can't actually see the crime being committed, but what he sees is fingerprints, footprints, bloodstains, scuffs on the carpet, um, all these sorts of evidence which add up to an understanding of how the crime was committed. So fossils are of that type. DNA is of that type. If you look at the DNA in different animals, compare, you've got, we've got it up here, beautiful picture you've got for the backdrop. If you look at the DNA of different animals, for a start, all animals and plants have the same, the same DNA code, which is a remarkable fact in itself. And then uh, that there are minor differences in the actual sequences, the actual letters that are spelled out by the code. And if you look at those differences, you find that they form a perfect hierarchical pattern. It's a family tree. Now, this is massive, massive, massive quantities of evidence left lying around the earth in every species of creature that's ever been looked at is carrying around massive quantities of evidence in the DNA. Then there's fossils in the rocks, massive quantities of evidence, lots of other evidence. Yes. I mean, to me, in the closing 40 seconds that we have, Richard, is that the complexities of the DNA, to me, speak of a very intelligent designer and not something that evolved over billions yes, of years. Yes, but you can't use the intelligent designer to explain anything because you have to explain where the intelligent designer came in the first place. The whole beauty of evolution is that it explains how you start with simplicity and work up to complexity, to the illusion of design. Richard, we're in the literally closing seconds. Would you kindly come back and talk to some of the other people that we have? I'd be happy to receive an invitation. Thank you so much, Richard. Thank you. God bless you. Bye-bye. Well, I presume you mean my background with respect to religion, not... not um, no, no, just of some of your personal background, you know, educated, where and brought up, and perhaps you're telling uh, about your parents. I was born in colonial Africa, came to England when I was eight, uh, went to boarding school, uh, went to Oxford, read zoology, a couple of years in California, uh, back to Oxford as a lecturer, and um, started writing books. My first book was The Selfish Gene, which was published in 1976, and I've been um, writing books sort of ever since. Were your parents uh, at all, or any of your immediate family, um, believers in God or, or all atheists? Um, I don't think my parents have ever been serious believers in God, except that one is as a child, of course. Uh, most people are as a child, as St. Paul said, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, etc. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. And I think, um, well, my father died a couple of months ago, 
Uh, he certainly wasn't religious. My mother certainly isn't religious. Um, so, no, I didn't come from a religious background, but my schools were religious. I mean, my schools were um, Church of England, and so I had the usual dose of Sunday chapel, daily chapel, actually, daily prayers. So was there a defining moment where you made a decision uh, that you, you didn't believe in God? Or? Yes, I suppose I, I switched from Christian theism to some sort of deism round about the age of 14 or 15, and then switched to uh, atheism round about the age of 16. 15, 16. And was there a particular point that, or something that you read or an experience you had that sort of said, yeah, this is it, God doesn't exist? Oh, well, by far the most important, I suppose, was understanding evolution. Um, I think the evangelical Christians have really sort of got it right in a way in seeing... Uh, e there are others in the Christian faith who see evolution as a part of what God's uh, purposes and plans there were. Are, but I, I've now got you placed then. You're, you're, so all I've got to do is convince you of the truth of evolution. That yes, I suppose easy. that. Yes. And, and, and I suppose my job is to, to prove that there is a God. And, and maybe without doing it in the usual way that I would share a couple of experiences with you and then you could tell me, and especially as I haven't read the book, the, the right. God Delusion, yes. then I'm not biased, although I understand that uh, where you're coming from, from the title, mm -hmm. um, I would nevertheless, you know, value your uh, opinion to put me right so that I can change horses if I have to. Well, let's get on with it then, shall right. we? Right, <laughs> good. Well, one of the things that I do see, and this is just was a fundamental question at the beginning uh, of, of my sort of putting the word out, to viewers and, and friends that, you know, I'm going to be doing this interview with you today, um, is that there are six billion uh, people on the earth today. And, and, and I would say at least uh, one third, if not more, have an innate belief in a, in a supernatural being, let's call him God. Uh, if we've evolved, why have we evolved with such a uh, concept to oh. want to worship? Yes, I think that's not really very difficult. I mean, I think it's very easy to see... You could answer that question psychologically and point out that uh, it can be very comforting to people to believe in some sort of supernatural father who looks after you, takes care of you, maybe raises you from the dead. Um, so it's very easy to see that if people believe what they want to believe, then they're likely to believe in in some sort of God. So that would be the psychological answer. I could also give you an evolutionary answer and say why it might be that natural selection of our past ancestors had shaped our brains or shaped the genes that shaped our brains uh, to uh, make us believe in, not God necessarily, but to have a sort of psychological predisposition mm -hmm. that leads you to believe in God. I'm thinking of things like a tendency to be obedient to authority. I could easily make a Darwinian case for why one should be obedient to authority, especially children perhaps, and from that would follow, under the right cultural conditions, a tendency to believe in God. Of course, when you say that however many billion people it is believe in some sort of God, many of them believe in a very different sort of God, and so it's a, it's a sort of shaky ground you're on if you try to build too much on the numbers of it billions rather, of people. It is rather strange to me, anyway, at this stage of my life, to, to see that there's so many that already it's, it's innate in them to want to believe, even if they're misguided, as perhaps your book goes into. Yes. Well, I don't find that very persuasive. I mean, it's certainly oh, true, but it doesn't make uh, that a lot of people do believe, but it doesn't make what they believe true. Mm. As I say, I'm going to be conducting this interview uh, not so much in intellectual arguments because I'm just not on your level, Richard. Uh, that's hopefully for the future when we do that with the others that will come, if you would so agree to that. But I'm going to read some of the emails and questions that came in from viewers. Oh, right. Um, and they're, they're along the lines that you'll be very good at answering, I know, that, but it would be good for our viewers and also... Uh, in, in this, what, we're, what I'm hoping to try and achieve like this is for our viewers to get to know the man, you know, the Richard Dawkins, rather than what they perceive or what they hear about you, because the <laughs> Internet's a powerful tool right. for, like for mistruths. You know, maybe I'll start there. I mean, talk to us about 
being an atheist and does that stop you from doing good works no of course it doesn't you know yeah, of the, all of that sort of thing because you, yeah. you're as much maligned as an atheist as I as I'm a Christian yes um, yes there's absolutely no reason to think that you need to be a Christian or indeed a, a, a Muslim or anything else in order to be good um, there's no correlation there at all um, and it would be not terribly praiseworthy I think if that were the case because if the only reason you were good is that say you were afraid of God or something, then I think you'd agree with me that that wouldn't be a very noble reason for being good. Uh Welcome to Revelation TV Studios. Uh, we are live. We didn't intend to go live, but uh, we're going to do that. And it reminds me really of when I first went live eight years ago on Revelation TV's first broadcast, and my heart is pounding. So, but nevertheless, it's a very special day for me, and I'd like to warmly welcome our special guest, Richard Dawkins. Richard, thank you so much for coming to the studios. Well, thank you very much. And I, can I just begin by offering my condolences for your very sad tragedy that's hit you thank this you, week. Yeah. Thank you, Richard. I appreciate that. I did intend to uh, do a lot of preparation and even endeavor to read your books, uh, but the problem that we had Ron, was that the family tragedy. You know, one of our family members was uh, killed by uh, a motor accident and uh, he died instantly and it's just been very hard for the family to handle. But I, I really do appreciate uh, your thoughts. Thank you very much, Richard. And I am going to struggle as best as I can to um, interview uh, and talk with Richard. And I know that our viewers, like myself, who now have not perhaps read some of the books or any of Richard's books, he's a well-known author and is uh, one of the, the world's leading atheists, really. Uh, and Richard, you know, Give us some of your background, because I, I would be thrilled, and I know some of our viewers will, some of them will be upset, but that's never stopped me in the past. And I would really like you to share with us your background uh, so that people would understand where you've arrived at today in being an atheist. Evolution as the enemy, um, whereas the more, what should we say, sophisticated theologians who are quite happy to live with evolution I think they're deluded, and I think the, I think the evangelicals have got it right uh, in that there really is a deep incompatibility between evolution and Christianity, and I think I realized that at the age of about 16. Right. Well, first of all, I appreciate you even saying what you said, but I think this is one of the things I'd like to get out of this interview, that, you know, even though we have differences, I, I, I do believe that we can discuss these and uh, I certainly would like to invite you uh, it's like the, not the interviews over now but I'd like to invite you in the future if you would so consider to talk to some of our I would say uh, more intellectual minds than myself uh, who would be able to debate the subject and and do it on in a in a gentlemanly way because some of the interviews I've seen conducted um, particularly one of recent times I saw on, on YouTube, which I thought you were treated abominably. Oh, really? I yeah, wonder I, what that one was. I don't I, remember it. Was it, uh, was it uh, one of the interviewers in the States where he was like, he's like a news presenter, maybe Fox? Oh, yes. Well, um, I've done a few of those, yes. Yeah. Um, Bill O'Reilly, maybe. That, I think that was, yes. could be. Yeah. I think, anyway, it's not the way that I want to conduct our interviews, and indeed any of the debates that may follow with some of the more wiser uh, people that I would like to introduce you to. Um, and I do see you as a, an English gentleman and, 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 and not one to be berated, and, and perhaps people will be angry at me saying that, uh, but I do value your thoughts, and, and maybe we can arrive at somewhere in the distant future or not too distant future, uh, at a, some sort of agreement, even if it's a, to disagree, but, but we've talked the way through these, because it is important fundamentally to a Christian, if, if evolution is, to me, if it is a fact, then, then we are deluded and we need, we're without hope, as the Bible says. Oh, well, that's interesting. So, so you're saying that you do 
as it were, put your money on evolution being wrong? I do personally. Yes. Yes. Um, but